Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Pete, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. Sam and I, nice to be here. I'm honored by the invite. Most certainly, most certainly. Obviously, everyone has a journey of how they became an entrepreneur and of how they overcame the obstacles to become an entrepreneur. Can you share a little bit about who you are and how you became an entrepreneur? Yeah, I come from a long line of drunken bar fighting Irishmen. My uh, my mother was 19 when I was born and hadn't finished high school. She didn't do so until she was 48. But she was uh, she's very smart and very entrepreneurial and uh, had this funny idea in her mind that she was going to raise yuppies. I think my first exercise in actual entrepreneurship was uh, we had a housekeeper because my mom, so she owned a barber shop. She cut the hair of all the big business guys in town. But uh, and I saw I, I was probably 10 or 11 and I said uh, she my mom came home. I said, what do you pay that gal? She said, I don't know, $25 a week. And this is in like 1978 or 79 when $25 a week made an 11-year-old the richest kid in town. So I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that instead and you give me the 25. And she said, absolutely not. You will never. Do you see how clean she gets this place? And, and well, I, I talked her into it and I became the best housekeeper, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in L.A., so, so that's where, that's where it began. And, and it was surely with her encouragement, it's kind of in the blood. I didn't really mean to start this business when I started it, but I, you know, was working for somebody that I didn't um, admire from a ethics perspective. So uh, I, I, you know, made a very tough decision to leave when I had a stay at home mom, two small children and zero dollars in savings. So uh, it's been it's been harrowing. I've made more stomach acid probably every month in the last 20 years than, you know, smart people with good jobs make in a lifetime. But it's been it's been fun. And I really, uh, it's been a great integral part of my life. Judging from the back wall, you seems like a, you're a musician as well. I uh, before um, be, before all the business, be, literally before I'd ever read a book, I um, I started playing rock and roll. And, uh, you know, it's really just because I have no game. I'm not really, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any talent. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, not particularly shy. I'm a decent dancer for, you know, middle-aged white man. And uh, so, yeah, so I started singing. I was a terrible singer. I was telling you the story before. And then um, the guitar player, who was my close buddy, said, hey, I think you should play the bass. Really, he was saying, I think you should stop singing. But the poor guy. Within six months, I was a terrible bass player and a terrible singer, and he had to kick me out of the band. But I don't get uh, I don't get discouraged that easy. So, sixteen to twenty six, music was a huge part of my life. My I am still very close friends with uh, with one of my my best friend from um, from about fifteen to you know I played in a, a long haired eighties rock band with him. He's now taken his company public on the Toronto Venture Exchange. We say that the the best education we had in entrepreneurship was uh, was running that band you know we had to invent the product we had to um you know make the product we had to sell the product we had to deliver the product it was it was a great great exercise in and a fun exercise in uh and getting what we wanted out of life through entrepreneurship most certainly obviously it, it prepared you to run this business today and you're also successfully running uh i think you said about 40 or 50 uh members in your company yeah, well. yeah there's only uh 30 employees, but we have 20 very tight knit um, independent contractors who um, span everywhere from, you know, within a couple of miles of each of our offices all the way to, you know, one of our most important um, uh, consultants lives outside of Prague in the Czech Republic. He had been an employee that uh, that uh, worked in Southern California. He moved and for 10 years ran the Portland office. And at some point he uh, he said, I'm, you know, I'm moving back home. He was uh, he moved. He escaped Czechoslovakia as a child. He said, but can I still work for you? Yes, you can. Obviously, with the technology, it doesn't necessarily matter where you are today. And you can essentially work from anywhere. 
So of all the things you've accomplished, obviously you're a musician and, and was in a band and was able to build this business and been able to run this quite quite well for the over the years. And like you were telling me earlier, you decided not to participate in the COVID uh, and to continue to successfully grow the company even during that time. So of all the things you've accomplished, what would you say you're most proud of? Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm working right now on what is uh, my, my proudest accomplishment, and that's having built a solid, a really good management team. I think that uh, management teams, you know, like, like good parents, you know, if the parents are connected in a family, you have a healthy family. And if the parents aren't, you have a less healthy family. I think that uh, as goes the management team, so goes the company. And uh, I have a, a closely connected um management team. Naturally, we don't agree on everything, but we have a healthy respect for one another and we we work through things and and therefore the culture of my business is much healthier than it's ever been. I'm a, I'm personally a terrible manager for most people. I'm really difficult to work with. I'm a, you know, I'm a perfectionist and and I I don't, you know, I on the, literally on the back on the screen, I can see it behind you, my the, the background on my computer screen says something about the flexibility of behavior is the um, true sign of leadership and whoever has that, you know, the, it, you know, it's better to whisper in someone else's language than to shout in your own. And I have to have things like this mm-hmm. to remind me all the time because I'm a shouter in my own language. And for, for line level, um, you know, employees, I'm just too hard on them. I just make them sad. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's a, it's a select few that, that can deal with my abrasive personality. And I think, and, and, I, and I think the important lesson you learned is that you recognized it because I think yeah. the, the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is that they don't have that self-awareness of what, what their key strengths are and then trying to find the compliments in others who might be able to come alongside and help you fill in the void where you don't have the strengths. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so. Like, you know, I'm really good at process. You know, my, my degree comes from the engineering department. I've got a bachelor of science in construction management. That's what I ended up doing. I, dig, I dug ditches at 16 and I eventually at 26 got a college degree in construction management. Because when you're in when you're in the band, you're either in food service or you're in construction. And I was in construction. My buddy I told you about that took his company public is uh, was in food service. So he still does all the cooking in the family. Yeah. So what is the big lesson you learned in the process of building the company? For me, business is very personal. I have a lot of energy. Is It might not be a surprise. So I have a burning desire to have a wonderful company that serves the people that, um, that work in it. But I also have an even more burning desire to have a wonderful life. Yeah. No, um, no. So the, the lesson, though, I, 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 for me is to, um, is to delegate what I am terrible at. And that's the, the line level um, one-on-ones. And to focus on um, on systems and processes. But so I think to take a company from bad to good, you um, use those ba- basic tools like those described in traction. And to go from good to great, you use the tools kit from Lean Six Sigma. And so so I, 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 I set up processes. I, it, it's been 20 years, so I, I obviously wasn't very good at it. You know, it's taken me a long time to get to where I am, but, um, but get, you know, getting the right people in the right seats is, you know, yeah. it's hard for me because I'm a micromanager. I want to be a micromanager. I want things just so the way I want them, but, uh, learning to let go of that has been a, it's been an important learning for me. It, which brings me to the question, which is kind of typically I asked toward the end of our discussion is about the systems and process. And I think. The biggest struggle that most entrepreneurs have is, you know, they're trying to build a company, they are trying to innovate on the product side, they're trying to acquire customers, they're also trying to bring on the teams. And it's very hard um, to to be able to kind of see the big picture, come up with a process, checklist, quality uh, standards, things of that nature. So can you give me a little bit more practical examples of what you do uh, in terms of, from your knowledge of, um, you know, building this company, how does an entrepreneur go about building those systems and process? So I, um, from the beginning, I, I wrote a business plan before I, uh, before I started the business. So for key people, I let the, I literally let them read the business plan. We do silent start meetings the same. We stole that from Amazon. So we sometimes just sit, we have a management meeting and we'll sit for a half an hour or 45 minutes and read, um, long form stuff that one of us has written. 
Um, we have, I have process posters literally on the wall. Now, you know, in the COVID, they're only 11 by 17, but, uh, but that's, you know, that's the top level process poster for what we do, what we sell to clients. And more recently, so we didn't have a marketing and sales team until we didn't have a fully fleshed out marketing and sales team until after COVID hit. You know, we were, we were bumping along, you know, growing, you know, growing reasonably rapidly uh, just by uh, referrals and repeat business. But we decided we wanted to take it up a notch. We knew that we, if we're going to acquire a couple other businesses, we've got to, we got to bring something to the table. And so we're bringing marketing and sales team to the table. So we um, created a marketing and sales system flow chart. Um, so this, this, you can't, you won't be able to read it, but this, you know, this has a brief description of every role and the team is so new that I have to have their names written in, um, in, uh, in grease pen on the, on the, on the 11 by 17 version. And, uh, it's got the, the objective for the role, the key performance indicators, uh, for each of those roles. So we can, and we sent, we literally had 11 by 17 copies laminated and sent to everybody on the team so they can sit and and look so we can you know it's like the like like the dragon boat uh you know drummer you know it's like this is where we're going everybody you know jump in so we were able to build that team and it's really running in a wonderful way because we have that you know we, we, we before we had that we were trying to build a team you know we're building the air you know i mean the airplane's flying and we're trying to we're trying to build it out so um it was much messier before we had that diagram mm -hmm. and before we had a good manager who was um you know I, I we had some people come onto the team and i was kind of directly managing them and i did the same darn thing i did to you know i i haven't learned enough to directly manage people so we got somebody in to protect these poor people from my abrasive personality <laughs> so the, the the key ingredient here on you know when you're trying to create the documentations right um, you know, some of the functions that you're trying to fill requires creative thinking, um, you know, the yep. strategic mindset, of critical, you know, critical skills that are not necessarily something you can just document, right? So how do you account for that creative aspect of any sort of a thinking that might be required to do the job versus, okay, here's how we do a certain thing, right? So I know even in your business, you are, you're in the consult, uh, consulting business, uh, especially for the companies that are actually went through a bad experience in the construction process. Uh, so... Yes, you can kind of document what you do, but you still need that thinking, the critical side of things, right? So how do you account for that part in the systematizing of a business? This is a, this is a great, great question. So, um, because so, so just to back up, we, you know, the, the foundation of our expertise is in building inspection, testing and construction management. So we have a whole big team of architects and engineers and building inspectors and former construction contractors and uh, construction project managers. And um, those people literally get named as expert witnesses on something like 80% of our work. So we still do real work. Many of the people we compete with don't do real work anymore. But in order to do real work, you got to have uh, different muscles than being able to um, testify about things. So, but all of our work, something between two and 300 projects a year right now, every one of them requires um, abstract problem solving nothing is wrote no two projects are the same so we we have to have a structure that literally has hold points for like have we applied professional judgment have we summarized the, the situation we, we literally keep pictures of my mom you know we talked about my mom so i have a picture of my mom at her high school graduation when she was 48 years old and we use this in our training and we say pete's mom is a very smart person but she didn't graduate high school until she's 48 years old. She's not in construction. She's a barber. Very, again, very, very smart person, but not technical. Explain the situation to her. And until you have, until you can, you, you're not just not done. So go back to your office, talk to somebody about it, get a team together, whatever we have to do. We, we, this morning, we had a, a an all staff meeting. We have an all staff meeting every Tuesday morning. They're actually better now that they're on zoom, by the way, rather than half the people in the room and half the people on zoom. And we did a structured, um, brainstorm, um, called team consulting that I got from one of my, um, you know, one of my many paid mentors, um, uh, taught us this structured, 
um, brainstorming process, and we did that for for it. So we, you know, uh, um, so we so we do things like that. We do structured brainstorms. We do exercises. We have we're um, very disciplined about our meeting management method. It was my first very my very first blog post. I did two of them on the same day, ten years ago. Yeah, you know, almost exactly ten years ago. And one's a video of our meeting management method. So we were very structured about creating a meeting agenda and creating action steps in that meeting. And then in following meeting, whatever the action steps we were, whether there's two or 200, those action steps are old business in the next meeting. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem hard, but literally we've hired people who just can't do it and we have to find them another place to work. Mm-hmm. How do you then take the process? I know that critical thinking aspect of you're doing those exercises so you can have someone kind of see how you would in the real world try to solve that problem, right? But then how do you distill that into those diagram that you showed, take such a big business you know, processes into a simple diagram that says, here's the diagram of how you would execute this business. So now that I'm home, I um, behind that closet door right there, you open the door and, and I have the stickies that are um, the, or the, the giant, um, what would be a flip chart pad, but they have the, they're from Post-it so that I can um, do multiple iterations. In the office, I have many um, four by eight whiteboards and we literally just draw them. Some In our system, we have a, I have a magical information system where everything is connected to everything that we've been working on for. I've had the same genius IT guy on staff for more than 15 years. So we have a training system like a a LMS, a learning management system. We looked at all of them and realized we could build one just as good and it would be integrated in our system. So we did. But sometimes the, you know, sometimes we have fancy flow charts like I showed you because, you know, we put those on the wall. But most of them, literally, I take a picture of it with my iPhone and email it to myself. So we do these flow charts and we and then we realize they're not right. They're never perfect. They're always going to be continuously or continually improved. So I just, you know, start, you know, first I make a list. I literally have a blog post called a sensible list. So some people can't make sensible lists. So you got to get people that can make a sensible list. What's step one? What's, you know, the final step, whatever it is, whether it's, whether the final step is seven or 70, you know, we have checklists like our webinar checklist. I think it's got more than a hundred items on it. And we do a web one, at least one webinar a month. It's not, you know, we're not building iPhones, but there's a lot of moving parts, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, things should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. I think that's Einstein or somebody like that. <laughs> it's an iterative process. Make a list, put it on a flow chart. If you can't, you know, the, all the quality gurus say, if you don't think of what you do as a process, you don't understand it well enough. Mm-hmm. It's a process. Things are a process. They're repetitive processes. So basically then my other question is in terms of from the the quality assurance standpoint, right? So it's one thing that you can write it, you can document it, you can have, uh, you know, uh, the checklist, you know, but then if you, when you bring on someone new, how do you ensure that the same output, especially if they're out in the field representing your brand, doing certain things, right? How do you ensure that the same quality outcome comes from every individual that's going to be representing your brand out in the field? So one of the, so number one, we're not perfect at it yet. That's literally what you're um, what you're seeing on the floor here is a pre is an internal presentation I give called our quality journey. Mm-hmm. It's going from where we are to something much closer to perfection. And all of our flow charts have quality control hold points that says quality control there. Can't see it. Um, and we have a we we say it out loud. We have a peer review culture, so it's much better to have an uncomfortable conversation inside our office than an ass kicking outside our office. Some people uh, like me are not sensitive and somebody can say, that's stupid what you're saying. And I go, it is? Well, let's fix it. And some people go in, into the bathroom and cry. So we have to, you know, we, somebody more somebody more sensitive to me has to work with those really sensitive people. Um, I saw a great um, interview of Jeff Bezos by Charlie Rose. It's an interview where he talks about um, not letting defects run downstream. And um, we, again, we're not perfect at it yet, but we're getting very close. 
So peer review culture, quality control hold points in the plan. You've got a plan. And I think, can you elaborate on a little bit more on that quality? So is it like the process stops at a point where someone has to verify that the quality is there before they proceed to the next step? Is that what I'm hearing? That's right. That's okay. exactly right. We have a training page on how to do a peer review, for example. So so literally, our, and like when I get something, and you know, I'm a technology guy. I've got a minor in information systems. I've invested many man, uh, man years of my own work. Plus, I've been paying a guy an obscene amount of money for 15 years to build this information system and yet our, our quality control system we print the documents and we write on the documents and we scan the documents into our peer review we build a plan we in our flow charts we have a you know we have a place to stop and say have we applied professional judgment does this qualify for does this does this qualify as a, what we have a technical definition for awesome work have we done a peer review? There's a there's a document in our training system that describes how to do a peer review. And we have many quality control checklists or report cards where they we ask questions and we grade the quality of individual components of our analysis on a one to five scale. Uh, positive reinforcement works. Um, my um, natural inclination to, you know, to, to be mean over mistakes is a huge mistake. That's why I don't get to talk to the staff. I only get to talk to the managers. In an environment where there's a is a fast moving environment, they're probably doing a lot more than 200 projects a year, right? And it might be a smaller, short, shorter length projects, but it still require creative thinking. And it might be an industry where they may not have professional training, like who's an architect, right? So you might have architects who are professionals who went through the training. So here you have. You're bringing college grads, but you're probably bringing them into your company. You're teaching them your business, your process, what you offer as a service or your product. And then you're at a faster environment where you don't have the luxury of probably doing all these things that you're describing as a way to do quality assurance. How do you kind of condense this to ensure that you can still do what we're talking about, the creative thinking aspect of it, as well as that quality assurance, doing it at a much higher pace? So, that, so now you're asking what I actually think that, you know, if I were ever to get famous, by the way, I don't want to be famous of the rich and famous combination. I only want to be well, one of those. And um, but if I were to get uh, business famous, at least, I think it would be in taking the, um, the body of knowledge of project management um, skills and practices and education and translating that down to professional services. So my business looks much more like a law firm than it does a construction company. We do construction projects, but we run them the same way we run, our, run all of our consulting gigs. And so we have a slimmed down version of, um, of project management practices, but you always have to have a scope of work. You always have to have a budget and you always have to have a schedule, even if it's a tiny job. And if, you're, if you have a new um, project manager, who is say straight out of college, we would call that person a project coordinator, but only after they've been here three months and they've proven they've gone through a, a bunch of our training and proven that they can at least do it rudimentarily. But we always create a scope and a budget and a schedule. So for us, we have, you, you might, this is my, this is my marketing thing. And at the top it's written, you know, we're trying to create an internal digital content marketing agency that's good enough to sell to other people who are as smart as us. Mm -hmm. We're not going to sell it because that's not what we sell, but we're, I want, we want to be good enough at it. So we run campaigns and the campaign coordinators and managers have to create a scope and a budget and a schedule. And, and they have to compare their performance to that plan, right? In that, that eventual plan. So, you know, we create a, a list of milestones and deliverables. We, you know, in, in construction, that's called the schedule of values in generic project management parlance that's called the scope of work we outline it in a two-level work breakdown structure so uh, you know every project has a two-level work breakdown structure that describes a hundred percent it's a hundred percent summary of the project and so we do a hundred percent summary of the project in work breakdown structure we do a budget we do it we do a budget and an actual column you know if we're doing it in excel we have magical tools in our information system we can punch them out to excel to make them pretty if we want to ship them but we also do a schedule based on that same schedule of values mm -hmm. so we've got the scope and the budget and the schedule in one document and we can say all right let's go get them and then we just create 
quality control hold points, usually that's just a project status meeting. And we look, well, we want it to be done with items one, two, and three by now. Well, we're done with item one, but items two and three aren't done, but we've started items 17, 19, and 40. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, consulting work is always going to be like herding cats, right? It's like, oh, look, a chicken. You know, you, you just get distracted, right? I mean, long before we had the, the Facebook and all of this other crap, distraction was a struggle. So, it, you know, redirecting, get, having status meetings where we look back at the plan, look at the plan. What's the plan say? What's the plan? You, you, it's like it's like having a toddler, right? Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. I mean, it's just constant redirection back to the plan. And it, it's fine. You're doing something that's not on the plan. Either there's only two choices here. What you're doing is not on the plan. Either the plan is wrong or you are wrong. Let's decide in our project status meeting. Let's just decide. Mm -hmm. And where does the KPI part fall into this? So let's just say in the example of what you described about your marketing. So you have the schedule, you have the budget, you have the, the kind of the plan of what needs to get done. So where does that KPI comes into the equation there? So project level KPIs are, are hard, right? And, and for us, thankfully, our work is relatively, most of our work is relatively elastic in that the minimum we can bill on a litigated project and not have the client be mad, you know, because if we ignore them, and build zero, they're mad. But in the maximum we can build without them being mad um, is very elastic. We can, you know, it's more than 100%, you know, so uh, uh, some project, if we only build $5,000 doing the minimum we had to because we're so busy, um, they, they wouldn't be mad. They wouldn't have been mad if we built them $10,000 because we did everything we wanted. And frankly, in many instances, even if we took too long and build them 15, they wouldn't be mad. Uh, so it's it, it you know luckily for them uh, and for us we're busy and don't have don't ever have time to do the fifteen we only have time sometimes to do the one hundred percent what we'd like to do usually not even that you know we usually do like the minimum but um, the issue so for us um, we're still working on a roll up of one hundred percent of the company's KPIs from the smallest project to um, for every single thing but so we always quantitatively can look at the project plan, the original project plan. Usually we just have, what was the original plan? What's the current plan? You know, because we have the listing of the schedule values and each, uh, or the, the scope of work, and each one has a budget. And then you can put an actual next to it. But what's the, so we have a current plan, or excuse me, we have a, an original plan. And I, I, I have an example on, on the web, I think that like the original plan had levels one and two, we usually do five levels from, you know, like if we, we do a preliminary investigation all the way to, we went to trial and testified trial. We do, we break that up in five levels. Um, so, you know, the first plan only had levels one and two, and it was for $15,000. And the, the, the updated plan has levels all the way one through five. And so that's $50,000. And we built, and then the column on the right hand side is what have we built to date? To date, we've built $17,250.80. Did I say that way it made sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. So, so and we're, we're getting more and more and more where we don't do any of that in Excel. It's all automatically populated in the system. Now, at, at first, that's not, you know, and, it, and, and at first blush, that's not what, you don't need that, right? You could do it on a yellow pad and, and you know, write out the scope of work and when you're going to do the stuff and then go, okay, what do we do? Mm -hmm. and, and for most people, as long as you do, even if it's entirely qualitatively comparing plan to performance, it's enough. I know you talked a lot about the systems and process. And obviously, as an entrepreneur, right, you don't just get to that just from college degree or you don't just get to that from uh, just being in the business. You had to have a lot of consultants and you worked with a lot in terms of helping you get there. So what, what was that journey in terms of how you went about getting to where you are today? Well, before I could um, afford consultants, I read ev virtually every business book that there was. I have a pile of them over there, but it's, that's only a tiny, tiny fraction of what was, was read over time. Um, so I have, uh, you know, my, my, I think my first one was a marketing consultant. And then I hired a, uh, a finance guy to try and really get my, I knew that I wanted um, financial reporting 
that was um, very sophisticated. So, and I've hired, I hired many finance uh, consultants to help me get there, including my own CPA. I have this infamous, infamous CPA memo that I uh, that basically led to. It was actually two memos. It was my meeting with him and saying, "I want this is what I want." Blah 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 blah. And I wrote it up in a memo. And basically, my CFO at the time took one look at it and was like, "This means I'm fired, doesn't it?" <laughs> yeah. Um. So, but literally, that that memo is 12 years old now, and I still use it as I used it as the job description to hire my finance manager, my current finance manager, who's a rock star. I joined YEO the minute I could afford it. I, I, the minute my business did a million dollars in sales. Um, if you go to my website, you can't see my, you don't, you don't find my picture on the team page. You do find on the about page, a thing that says our founder. And it's a picture, it's one of those old time pictures of me. It looks like it was taken in the 1920s or something. Because I, I think I'm fun. I'm assuming that was purposeful. I remember being on the about page and wondering why that was black. It looked like a, a picture from a movie movie poster or something like that. Right. It's a, I, I want people to think that Pete Fowler is a guy who started a business, with, you know, way back when and died in the 40s. <laughs> so I, seriously, I do. I, I run into people who, you know, been, I've been in this business 20 years. So everybody knows the name of the business, but you mostly from the other consultants who work with us. Mm -hmm. In, the, in our business, our, our consultants, and they look at me, and especially 10 years ago when I, you know, looked a lot younger, and uh, they're like, you're Pete Fowler? Like, like Pete Fowler Jr.? Like, no, no, Pete Fowler. There's only one of us. So, um, so I, they, you know, I, I want them to think that Pete Fowler died in the 40s so that they don't, you know, it's like Charles Schwab. Nobody calls Charles Schwab an asper. Hey, I'd like to talk to Chuck or Michael. <laughs> Michael I'd like to talk to Michael Duff. That's what I want to be like. I'm not quite there, but that's, you know, that's what I'd like to be. It's a good aspiration. So obviously, how is how has your perspective on like building a business changed over the years after you've, like you said, you've run it for 20 years now? How has that evolved over these years? When I started the business, I assumed that, uh, that I would have a business much larger than I have right now within two or three or four years because I assumed I was a great genius who already knew everything I needed to know. And... Um, and as uh, you know, when, when I, 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 I subscribe to the saying that people uh, often say, they say, oh, everything happens for a reason. Like, yeah. And usually the reason is I'm a dumbass and I make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm in the market to buy other similar businesses to mine. We, we now have built up to the point that we have more management depth. Um, we, we could do a lot more work faster. And I'm not going to be able to grow organically as fast as my management team could gobble up. Um, other similar businesses. So I was talking to a business owner who, you know, had a, you know, so we're around 50 people. He's around 10 or 15. And he said, why do you want to do this? Why, why, what do you, what's, what, what's in this for you? And my answer is, you know, he's like, why don't you just sell it and be done? It's like, you know, first of all, I, I, if I didn't have to get up in the morning, I, I would, you know, I come from a long line of people who drink and smoke themselves to death. And I need to have something to do. And I, but I really like the business more than I ever have. And I'm continuing to improve myself personally, right? I mean, I, I like the idea of creating a, a, a place that um, does really that does work that makes me proud and nourishes the people that work in it. And that's really exciting to me. It's really neat. It's fun um, to do that. So my change perspective is um, that I just didn't, you know, I. I wasn't the leader a larger enterprise needed. I needed to change. I needed to become, I needed to have more emotional control. I needed to be kinder and gentler. I, um, I needed to, um, to let go of perfectionism. And, and in order to get to more perfect on a larger scale, I had to, I had to let people learn from that for themselves. I'm still learning that, honestly. I mean, I'm still learning that. And it, um, and, and to set up systems that are, are to, to let the people who are doing the work set up the systems and, but you know, like the, and, and where they set up gating criteria that don't allow defects to run downstream to the clients. Mm -hmm. And, but, but they, but they have to do that themselves. They have to have, they, they have to see their fingerprints on those, 
on those standards. They have to, and, and I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, and I've always known that, um, you know, that, that all of us are smarter than any of us. I've never had any um, unrealistic, um, <laughs> I, I really in the process realized I'm not that smart. Uh, my, the, I sometimes do things that might look like the work of a genius, but it's just elbow grease. And I've really always known that. I just work harder than average. But I, but I haven't always had the money or the patience to let people learn their own lessons and to let them get invested in the process. And it's fascinating to me when I look in, like how stupid I have been to, to let it go for so long. So, I mean, so, so as I, you know, when I look at the trajectory of the business, it really is the trajectory of my maturity mm -hmm. as, a, as a leader. So, so it's nice to see it bigger because I know that that's a, a, a reflection of my maturity, but I'm not even close to where I'd like to end up. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'll get fired next year and be done, but I don't think so. I, I really am enjoying it more than ever because I'm still learning and growing and getting getting um, emotionally stronger. And I mean, that translates directly into my life. My personal relationships, I think relationships are a mirror, and my personal relationships with the people that I live in the house with and that, you know, my children are 22 and 24, and my wife-to-be is just as lovely a human as I've ever known. And, um, I, you know, she wouldn't hunt around me until I got more mature. So obviously you're doing a lot, you're building a company of a leadership team, so there's a lot that you have as far as support structure. Are there any productivity hacks that you have uh, to keep you on track uh, to get all the things that you need to get done? So I, my phone, reads to me. I actually made somebody write a blog post on how to do it because um, my IT guy taught me this years ago. So I literally went into, I found that Google doc that you had sent me. I emailed it to myself as a PDF and, and I went, I go for a walk around the block um, multiple times a day to get my 10,000 steps. My watch tells me how much I've walked. So I go for a walk around the block and typically I have either an app called Pocket that I send articles to and it reads me the articles or I um, email myself uh, PDF files and I have the phone read to me while I'm on my 15 or 20 minute walk. That's my favorite because I, I just, you know, getting the time to read as much as I used to, it's, it's harder than ever for me. So that's, I read, you know, and I of course listen to a lot of audio books. Yeah. You and, you and me both, I think you've uh, talked about a bunch of things. So I'm a very process guy but I'm a horrible manager and I'm learning the hard way. And I think when you talked about the perfectionism, that's my biggest heart, uh, my roadblock because the perfectionism gets in the way of actually execution because my brother always tells me, perfection is the enemy of good. Just get it done and just get it out the door, right? And that's actually, at least it's done. And I think that's where the execution as opposed to waiting for everything to be ready and perfect, uh, it's not is not always the, the best answer. Um, we use that phrase all the time. I 100% agree. Yeah. And knowing what you do know today, what advice would you give yourself, your younger self? Like it, let it go, man. <laughs> You're a crazy person. Let it go. If I could just focus on the bottleneck, what's the next bottleneck? Um, if I could just relax and focus on the next bottleneck, you know, we'd be, you know, uh, I, maybe I would be ready to retire and move on. Um, but I still, I still struggle to do that. Um, and it's not, you know, the stuff I do is ne it's never a waste of time, but it's not always the, the, the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And if I focused on the bottlenecks and just let everything in, mostly everything else go, that would be, it'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Everything else would be fine. <laughs> I'm yeah. just a crazy person. Yeah. And, and I think, all, and, and, and accept that you're a crazy person. <laughs> that's fine too that's yeah. fine too Pete I think you shared a lot of great wisdom I think the, the number one um, step in going toward letting go is the systems and process and until an entrepreneur can actually either empower the internal team to build the systems and process or work by themselves to build the systems and process they can never get to a level of letting go uh, and they can never have the confidence that the people behind them who's going to do the job will be executing at the quality standards that you expect to have, right? So I think that's the that's the biggest takeaway. Uh, Pete, I can talk to you for hours. There's a lot of wisdom here and we didn't even get through all the questions, but I certainly appreciate you sparing this afternoon and sharing your wisdom. And I, I thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Samuel, it's fun to talk to you. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. I appreciate it a lot.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.